Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 655, and today is August 13th, 2024. I'm the host of this show, Kyle Anslone. A lot of news to talk about on today's show, but first, we need to talk about the sponsor of the show, and that is the Edspat Money Summit. The Edspat Money Summit 2024 is the world's largest offshore event taking place entirely online from October 7th through the 11th. It's put on Mikhail Thorup, who is the host of the Edspat Money Show and a highly sought after Edspat consultant with over two decades of experience. So if you attend the summit, you will discover why international diversification is a must for those looking to preserve their liberty and their wealth. You're going to learn every Everything you need to know about crafting your perfect plan B, how to diversify your finances offshore, quickly acquire a second passport, invest in international real estate, and get in-depth insights on geopolitics from world-renowned experts. Headline speakers include Dr. Ron Paul, Doug Casey, Scott Horton, Tom Woods, Mark Favor, Tom Logano, and others, including myself, Dave DeCamp, and Hervoya Morick, who are all on a panel for World War III fear-mongering or genuine concern. I know Hervoya and Dave really well, so I think that will be a really insightful panel. Very much looking forward to talking to those guys about geopolitics. And so, if you want to reserve your complimentary ticket, head on over to edspatmoneysummit.com. Again, that's edspatmoneysummit.com. Or if you just go in the show notes page, wherever you're listening to Conflicts of Interest right now, you can find my affiliate link for that complimentary ticket. Also, I have a link in there with my promo code, which is Kyle. And if you want one of the VIP tickets to the summit, you'll save 100%, or not 100%, $100 when you use that promo code. It's Kyle, very easy to remember. However, if you just want to click through from the link in the show notes page, I'll automatically add that promo code in there for you. All right, everyone, with that, let's just remind people that they can find the show at the Libertarian Institute and Antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey for the video version of the show. You could subscribe anywhere you listen to audio podcasts, and of course, follow me on Twitter at Kyle Anslone underscore. All right, let's get into the news today. First up here is from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. Putin says Ukraine launched Kursk offensive to gain leverage for peace talks. So Russian President Vladimir Putin said Monday that Ukraine launched its invasion of Russia's Kirk Osblast with Western backing to gain leverage for future negotiations. The Russian leader said it was clear why Ukraine refused our proposals to return to the plan for a peaceful settlement. Back in June, Putin made a public peace officer offer to Ukraine that would have required full Ukrainian withdrawal from the Russian oblast that had been annexed including Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kershaw. So Putin said, The enemy, with the help of its Western masters, it is doing their bidding, and the Westage waging war against us using Ukrainians seeks to improve negotiating positions in the future, Putin said. The U.S. claims it was unaware of Ukraine's plans to launch a ground incursion into Kursk, but the U.S. is strongly backing the invasion by allowing Ukraine to use U.S. weapons, which marks a significant escalation in the proxy war. Now, I really hope that the U.S. is just lying when they said they didn't weren't aware of this uh, planned invasion beforehand, only because with the amount of weaponry and intelligence the U.S. is providing to Ukraine, if we don't know what they're doing with it, what they're planning to do with it, that's that's very concerning. Uh, we should be fully aware of essentially all Ukrainian military operations before they come about, simply because every single one of them uses U.S. weapons. And of course, without the U.S. intelligence and other information, it seems unlikely that Ukraine would be able to prepare some kind of operation like this. And so it, it 
it seems almost necessary that the U.S. had to have been involved and aware. Now, maybe they weren't aware of the date or the exact time that this was going to occur. Maybe they thought it would be a slightly smaller force or something like that. But I'm sure they had to have been aware. And again, it's almost more concerning if they aren't, just because if Ukraine is able to do whatever they want with American weapons, including invade Russia, and the Americans would have no idea. Well, I mean, that's a that's a certainly very concerning proposal as well. So Putin also appeared to say that he was ruling out negotiations with Ukraine. He said, but what kind of negotiations can we even talk about with people who indiscriminately strike civilians, civilian infrastructures, or try who try to create threats to nuclear power facilities? What can we even talk about with them? A Ukrainian soldier who spoke with the Financial Times also said the purpose of the v- invasion was for negotiations. We fight here and take their territory and then negotiations can start and we will have some land of theirs to trade for our land. The soldier also acknowledged that there are that diverting troops to Kirk incursion could lead to Russia capturing more towns in Donetsk, where Russia has been making steady gains. Also on Monday, the Ukrainian commander in chief claimed that his forces were now controlling a thousand square kilometers of territory in Kursk. The Russian defense ministry claims it has stopped a major Ukrainian breakthrough, but the fighting continues and over 130,000 civilians have been de- displaced. So it does seem that this is a pretty major incursion uh, that the Ukrainians were able to gain some footholds here. Now, I also understand that a lot of the territory that they claim to have captured isn't necessarily towns, villages, or even open fields or something like that. It's more forested land. And so you know, there probably weren't a lot of Russian defensive positions set up there. Uh, apparently, it was only border guards, so the Ukrainians were able to pretty easily break through. Uh, but now they're facing some stiff Russian resistance and losing a lot of their forces and some of their most advanced and best trained forces in this invasion. And so if it gets turned back, they will have effectively lost some very effective fighters with nothing to show for it and no benefits on the negotiating table. And in fact, it probably puts them in a worse negotiating position because the Russians are all now un- more unlikely to talk than they were before. All right, next up here, Senator Graham visits Kiev, calls Ukraine's invasion of Russia's Kirk beautiful. So Senator Lindsey Graham visited the Ukrainian capital on Monday and praised the Ukrainian invasion into Russia's Kursk Oblast, calling it a beautiful. Speaking to a reporter alongside Senator Richard Blumenthal, who's a Democrat from Connecticut, Graham said, what do I think about Kursk? Bold, brilliant, beautiful, keep it up. The White House has insisted it was unaware of Ukraine's plans to launch the ground incursion into Kursk, but is still strongly in backing the invasion as the U.S. is allowing Ukraine to use U.S.-provided weapons. Graham added that his message to the Biden administration is to give Ukraine the weapons they need to win the war, the war they can't afford to lose. While supporting the invasion of Kursk, the administration says it doesn't support long-range Ukrainian strikes inside Russia, although it hasn't defined how deep into Russia is too far. During their visit to Kiev, Graham and Blumenthal met with Zelensky, who is asking for the U.S. to support long-range attacks. So this is Zelensky after his meeting with the U.S. Senators. We discuss what exactly is needed to bring this war to an end and bring it to a just end. I explained our detailed need for long-range capabilities. The U.S. has backed... The U.S. backed incursion into Kursk marks a significant escalation of the proxy war and its major Russian response. Vladimir Putin has blamed the attack on Ukraine's Western backers, saying the West is... U- is waging war against us using Ukraine. All right, moving over to the Middle East now. This is a very interesting division emerging within the Israeli government. Golan calls Netanyahu's goal of total victory in Gaza nonsense. So on Monday, Israeli Defense Minister Yuav Golan called Prime Minister Ben Netanyahu's demand for total victory in Gaza nonsense, prompting a rebuke from Netanyahu. 
Gallant made the comments at a hearing of the Israeli Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee when asked why Israel hasn't invaded Lebanon. He said, I hear heroes beating drums of war and the total victory and nonsense. I haven't seen this courage when it comes up for discussion. The conditions of war in Lebanon that exist today are opposite of what they were at the beginning of the war. Glan said he wanted to take action against Hezbollah at the beginning of Israel's genocidal war in Gaza and that he wanted a preemptive strike, but he was denied. There was a chance to attack the hive then, and now the terrorists are swarming like bees, he said. In response to Galan's comments, Netanyahu's office accused the defense minister of adopting an anti-Israeli narrative. The office sent a statement that Hamas was to blame for the lack of a ceasefire deal in Gaza, despite the widespread acknowledgement that Netanyahu has been sabotaging the chances of an agreement. So Netanyahu's office said, when Gallant adopts anti-Israeli narrative, he harms the chances of reaching a deal for the release of the hostages. He should have criticized Hamas's leader, Sinwar, who refuses to send a delega delegation for negotiations and remains the only obstacle to any hostage deal. So Gallant and other top Israeli security, military and security officials favor a ceasefire deal in Gaza, but only a temporary one. Israeli media recently reported that the U.S. is willing to give Israel a guarantee that it could restart a genocidal campaign in Gaza after the first phase of any deal with Hamas. One reason why Israeli generals want a hostage deal with Hamas to, is to give the Israeli military time to rest and prepare for a full-blown war with Lebanon. Golan has previously said that a ceasefire in Gaza would mean escalation against Hezbollah. Then Yahoo and Golan have been at odds for the past 10 months, and U.S. officials are said to prefer a deal with the defense minister over the prime minister. In contrast with the prime minister, the defense minister enjoys the trust of American administration and is considered the voice of reason against Netanyahu, who is seen as someone who makes decisions that are meant to support his personal survival, a senior Israeli official told Haaretz. While the while considered more reasonable than Netanyahu, Golan has been itching for a war with Lebanon, and his comments uh, from him referring to Palestinians have been some of the most cited by people that have argued Israel is committing a genocide in the in Gaza. In the wake of October seventh, Golan denounced a announced a complete siege and said the Israeli military was fighting human animals in Gaza, which is populated by about one million children. And so, you know, we see this tactic again and again from the Israeli government, where anyone who who supports anything other than what Netanyahu wants is anti-Israeli. But not only that, they're interfering and in preventing a hostage deal from getting done. And so I think Netanyahu making these claims about his defense minister really weakens their effectiveness when he tries to make them about someone else or, you know, anybody tries to make them. They said that about the Israeli defense minister. Come on, this guy, this guy is absolutely 100% on board with Israel wiping out the Palestinians in Gaza and then going to war with Hezbollah. These people are not, you know, anti-Israel or they it's not that they don't want a hostage deal uh, because it's an omission of Hamas's victory. They just they, they see it as the strategic way of moving forward. All right. And, and the reason for a hostage deal, you know, is, is getting more important here, Hamas says one of its guards uh, killed one Israeli hostage, wounded two others. So Hamas's military wing, the Al Qassam Brigade, said Monday that one Israeli hostage in Gaza was killed and two others were wounded in two separate incidents involving Hamas guards. So the spokesperson said two Hamas recruits fatally shot one male hostage and two females were wounded. He said that Attempts are being made to save the lives of the two women. He added that a committee was formed to investigate the shootings. He said that Israeli massacres and resulting reactions were to blame for the incidents. So it sounds like they had somebody guarding, maybe a couple young men guarding these uh, recruits and something happened that upset them and they decided to take it out on the hostages by killing them. Uh, you, you know, maybe they were prevented. And so only one and not all three of the hostages were killed, but it sounds like a, a pretty brutal incident. 
So Israeli officials said they didn't have the intelligence to confirm or deny the statement. At this time, at this stage, we do not have any intelligence that allows us to refute or confirm the claims of Hamas, the IDF said. The statement was the first time Hamas has said that its guards killed an Israeli hostage inside of Gaza. Many Israeli captives have died since being taken into the Strip by Hamas fighters on October 7th, but they were likely killed by Israeli bombs or due to starvation uh, shortages of medicine. At least three Israeli hostages were gunned down by Israeli forces while waving a white flag. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been under pressure from family members of hostages in Gaza to reach a deal with Hamas, but he has been working to sabotage the chances of an agreement. All right, next up here, as things escalate in the Middle East, the U.S. is sending our National Guard men to the area. Uh, so this is from day to camp antiwar.com. Oregon National Guard sends 230 soldiers to Iraq and Syria. So the Oregon National Guard is sending off 230 guardsmen to Iraq and Syria amid soaring tensions in the Middle East as the U.S. is pledging to defend Israel from an expected Iranian reprisal attack. The U.S. has about 2,500 troops in Iraq and 900 in eastern Syria. The Oregon Guardsmen are likely being sent out on regular rotational deployment, but the move comes as the U.S. beasts up its presence in the region. According to the local NBC affiliate in Oregon, the unit is being deployed for a year and will serve as the primary artillery defenders for the U.S. and its partners in Iraq and Syria. The soldiers held a mobilization ceremony on Friday before they were sent to Fort Still in Oklahoma to undergo training before the deployment. The U.S. frequently deploys the National Guard to add to conflicts in Iraq, Syria, and Somalia. A national movement in the United States is seeking to remove the federal government's ability to deploy the National Guard to war zones through legislation at the state level known as the Defend the Guard Act. The Defend the Guard Act would prohibit the federal government from deploying a state's National Guard to a conflict zone where Congress hasn't officially declared war, which hasn't happened since World War II. The bill passed through several state legislatures but has yet to become law in any state. Visit DefendTheGuard.us to see if the Defend the Guard Act has been introduced in your state. Uh, and then if you're on Dave's article, you can click through to the different places to get the legislation. So the Oregon National Guard will soldiers will be deployed under the U.S.-led anti-ISIS coalition known as Operation Inherent Resolve. ISIS doesn't hold any territory in Iraq and Syria, but there still hasn't. But there's been a resurgence of ISIS attacks amid tensions and other escalation in the region. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the. 153 attacks in Iraq and Syria this year. In July, U.S. Central Command said that it had participated in 196 missions against ISIS with partner forces in Iraq and Syria, which killed 44 suspected ISIS operatives. But the U.S. has also been engaged in a battle with Iraqi Shia militias that fall under the Popular Mobilization Forces, who are the sworn enemies of ISIS and are a part of Iraq's security forces. From October 2023 to February this year, the militias launched hundreds of attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria in response to U.S. support for Syria's genocidal campaign in Gaza. The attacks culminated in the killing of three U.S. Army Reserve troops at Tower 22, a secretive U.S. base in Jordan. Forty-one members of the Arizona National Guard were also wounded. Iran and the Iraqi government pressured militias to stop the attacks, and there was a lull until recently. In the past week, several U.S. troops were injured in Iraq and drone attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria, and of course that came after the Israeli assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Haniya in Tehran, and it seems like that's probably, at least in part, what's stoking the tensions. All right, next up here, this article is from the Libertarian Institute by Liam McCollum, and it says, Donald Trump should endorse the Defend the Guard Act. And Liam writes, the newly adopted Republican Party platform promises to seal the border and prevent World War III. Donald Trump, who last month 
formally became the Republican Party's presidential nominee for a third time, should endorse the Defend the Guard Act as a way to achieve both. The Defend the Guard Act is state-based legislation that would prevent the deployment of National Guard units overseas into foreign wars unless Congress has officially declared war, as the Constitution requires. Despite being commonly dismissed as weekend warriors, the National Guard has been the primary fighting force in the global war on terror. 45% of those deployed in post-9-11 wars have been guardsmen, and guardsmen have also represent nearly 20% of the casualties in those wars. My father's childhood friend who was deployed with the North Dakota National Guard when he was killed in action in Iraq in 2012, the North Dakota National Guard would not have been in Afghan. Uh, he was killed in Afghanistan in 2012. The North Dakota National Guard would not have been in Afghanistan if the Defend the Guard Act had been the law in North Dakota and if states had insisted that Congress declare war first. In addition to their tremendous cost, none of the post-9-11 wars have been constitutional. In fact, Congress has not declared war as required by Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution since World War II, and yet the United States has intervened in countless overseas conflicts since then. An authorization for use of military force, AUMF, is not a declaration of war, but rather represents Congress's abdication of their authority and responsibility to declare war to the president, a situation the framers of the Constitution attempted to prevent. The results have been an asymmetry between foreign policy outcomes and the public wishes, and at great cost to the military and men and women who loyally serve in it. The American public has consistently favored withdrawal from our endless wars, while their government in D.C. has prolonged them. For instance, the public has repeatedly favored withdrawals from Syria, but famously top generals lied to President Trump when he attempted to leave. In addition, nearly three-fourths of veterans supported leaving Afghanistan when President Trump negotiated the original Doha Agreement, but the Biden administration recklessly pushed the withdrawal date from May to the middle of the fighting season, leading to a predictable disaster. The Defend the Guard Act would have prohibited National Guard units from being sent to any of those conflicts unless Congress, on behalf of the public, went on record first. An additional consequence of Congress's abdication is the National Guard has been fighting endless wars when they could have been deployed at the southern border or at home protecting communities from natural disasters. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, 3,200 Nash- Louisiana National Guardsmen were overseas in Iraq. When Florida was hit by hurricanes, 165 members of the Florida National Guard were training Ukrainians. Earlier this year, Arizona National Guardsmen were injured in a drone strike that killed three U.S. troops on the Jordanian-Syrian border when they could have been assisting Texas in its efforts at the United States border with Mexico. The above examples prove that Donald Trump bat the Defend the Guard Act. It would be consistent with his America First message and popular with his base of constitutional conservatives. After Greg Abbott sparred with President Biden over the Texas National Guard and the border earlier this year, the Texas GOP voted internally on the following Republican proposition. The Texas legislature should prohibit the deployment of Texas National Guards to a foreign conflict unless Congress first formally declares war. An overwhelming 84 percent supported the proposition, totaling more than 1.8 million voters. In addition to grassroots support, the legislation has been endorsed by Vivek Ramsaway, former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, Congressman Paul Gosar, Senator Ryan Paul, and of course, all the signatories below. And so he has some more listed down there. Last week, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. posted on ads, I support state level national uh, defend the Guard ads, which prohibit the deployment of National Guard abroad without a formal declaration of war by Congress. It will put a limit on the military adventurism and that we take for granted today as normal. A monumental vote in the New Hampshire House of Representatives, which is the second largest legislative chamber in the United States behind Congress, a Fox and Friends panel hosted by Will Kane, Pete Hensgith, and Kaylee McEnney, express resounding support for the legislation. To me, it makes a lot of sense, and I spent most of my career as a National Guardsman. 
I love it. I love it too. So everybody on that panel was positive about it. When I asked Congressman Thomas Massey about the effort, he said Trump to commit to respecting all aspects of Congress's sole authority to declare war, which includes all branches of the military as well as the Guard. The legislation is also tripartisan and Donald Trump's support would likely win over many independents and libertarians to his campaign. In June, the Matana Republican Party became the Sid State GOP party to adopt Defend the Guard language in its platform. To this day, the bill has been championed in over 30 states by Republicans and Democrat sponsors and co-sponsors. Over a quarter of them are military veterans with the Libertarian Party National Committee's endorsement and the help of many Libertarian Party state affiliates. So Angela McArdle, chair of the Libertarian National Committee, said, My goal over the next year is to gain support for this bill from prominent liberty-minded congressmen and senators like Matt Gates and Mike Lee. I think that the libertarian populist wave is sweeping the nation and people are often open to the idea of bringing our troops home. The Libertarian National Committee officially endorsed the legislation during McArdle's first term as LNC chair. In an effort to win over libertarian voters, Donald Trump pledged to commute Ross Albright's sentence and put a libertarian in his cabinet at the Libertarian Party National Convention in May. Endorsing the Defend the Guard Act is one more thing he could do to persuade libertarians since this has been one of the party's primary issue coalition efforts. I suspect Trump's endorsement would also win over many small L libertarians, the libertarian group being libertarian, which has over 500,000 followers across all media platforms, ran a poll on ads asking whether libertarians would vote for Trump if he publicly encouraged state governments to pass the Defend the Guard Act, if he supported Congressman Massey or Senator Mike Lees and the Fed legislation, and if he pledged to pardon Julia Assange, and 86% said yes. An endorsement of the movement is low cost to Trump since it's state legislation and also builds Trump. Trump does not have to actually sign the bill into law himself. For libertarians who are worried that Trump may not follow through with his other pledges to free loss or put party members in his cabinet and endorsement of state legislation is low hanging fruit and would instantly put this legislation on the map and push these bills over the finish line in many red states. So really good article by Liam there. And one more before we wrap up today, this one I wrote for the Libertarian Institute on August 12th, U.S. offers to drop charges against Venezuela's Maduro if he leaves power. So the Biden administration is pushing for Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro to resign in exchange for him receiving amnesty from U.S. drug charges. Washington recently contested the Venezuelan election, claiming that Armando Gonzalez Urita won at the polls. So the Wall Street Journal reported speaking with three sources who said the White House is willing to pardon Maduro and other top Venezuelan officials and agree not to seek extradition to the U.S. on drug trafficking charges. In exchange, Maduro would leave power before his presidential term ends in January. The journal described the policy as a long shot bid to force Maduro from power. According to Caracas, Maduro won the July 28th Venezuelan presidential elections. The State Department denied the result from the Venezuelan government and declared the main opposition figure to be the true president. For decades, successive American presidents have attempted to oust Maduro and his president or predecessor, Hugo Chavez. The coup attempts have failed to push the communist government from power in Caracas. Under President Barack Obama, the U.S. placed heavy sanctions on Venezuela. Once Donald Trump took power, he increased economic he increased the economic war and attempted to replace Maduro with Juan Guaido. Trump's Department of Justice charged Maduro with drug trafficking and offered a $15 million bounty for his arrest. While the sanctions and coups had not led to a regime change, it has increased the suffering of the Venezuelans. The U.S. economic war has contributed to tens of thousands of deaths. And so, seems to be the latest coup attempt doesn't seem like it's actually going to work and there is some question if the u.s is trying to after i wrote this article to morning i uh, this morning i noticed there was a new report in the miami herald 
saying that the U.S. did not actually offer it. But in that article, the U.S. official did indicate that all options were on the table. And so usually when they say that, they're kind of saying that "Ah, we didn't say it, but we did say it. So I'm assuming that they at least made an unofficial offer that led something like this. They just don't expect it to get anywhere. So it wasn't it wasn't that serious. All right, everybody, that'll wrap up the show for a day. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Back with more later in the week.